Hello. I'm Professor Chris Stasniak, and I welcome you all to this afternoon's discussion on food inequality in America. Uh, thanks to the McFarland Center, including Danielle Kane and tonight's moderator, Tom Landy, for making this happen. Before introducing our panelists, I want to take a few moments, just a few, to set some context to this event and our gathering this afternoon. This Wednesday, for the second time ever and first time since 1969, the White House will be hosting a conference on hunger, nutrition, and health. In doing so, it provides a unique opportunity to confront on a national stage the complex, scandalous nature of food and nutritional inequality in America. Food, nutrition, and diet is one of the starkest and most salient faces of American inequality. It is where interrelated disparities of race, class, gender, wages, health care, child care play out for millions of Americans each and every day. So it is against this backdrop, before they talk about food inequality in DC, that we will talk about it here with our esteemed panelists who have taken time to be with us this afternoon. And I think it is also worth recalling, especially for this Montserrat-heavy audience of first-year students, that this is what the imperative of a modern Jesuit education looks like. We are called to be women and men for others. Our education entitles a kind of obligation. That means we are just not passive recipients of information about the world around us. Rather, we are called to draw on our newfound knowledge and the privileges afforded us here to go out, confront the challenges in our world, and imagine what a better alternative might be. So that being said, this is a quick word on our panelists. Jean McMurray is the executive director of the Worcester County Food Bank. Like food banks around the country, the Worcester County Food Bank is a local hub for direct hunger relief, providing logistics and food to over 115 partner agencies that feed some 75,000 people. Winton Pickoff is the director of the Massachusetts Food System Collaborative, a unique policy nonprofit whose work facilitates collective action towards a more equitable food system in Massachusetts. Aaron McLear is a Holy Cross alum and president and CEO of Project Bread, a nonprofit that connects individuals and communities to reliable sources of nutritious food and advocates for a more accessible food system. Phoebe Wong is a Holy Cross student who last year spent her time working with Food Corps in East Hartford, Connecticut, connecting kids with healthy food in school, building out lesson plans, curriculum, and community partnerships. She did such a good job that she was asked to join everybody at the White House conference this Wednesday. I'm very jealous, Phoebe. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Jim McGovern. He is the congressional representative for the 2nd Massachusetts District, including his hometown of Worcester. Congressman McGovern has been a leading advocate for programs and reforms aimed at addressing food insecurity and nutritional inequality, and has been a leading force behind this unique and exciting White House conference on hunger. So with that being said, Tom, please take it away. Thank you, Chris. And thanks, everyone, for, for being here. I suppose the place to start, uh, Congressman McGovern, Jim, uh, what is the White House conference? How did it come about? Well, uh, we, as it was mentioned, the last conference on this topic was in 1969. That's the year we landed a man on the moon. Uh, and. Uh, and the conference kind of grew out of the fact that we had a hunger problem in this country. Um, and it was quite extensive. And out of that conference came things like WIC, the Women's Infants and Children's Program. Uh, a lot of what you see in the modern day SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, used to be known as food stamps, came out of that. Focus on child nutrition, um, you know, dietary guidelines, labeling on food because people were making bad, bad choices. And, a lot of, and so we made some progress. Uh, but then in the 1980s, since we've kind of backslided. And we're now gathered at a time when close to 40 million Americans don't know where the next meal is going to come from. We, we have a hunger problem in this country. Uh, and um, and it, it defies stereotype. People are hungry who are unhoused. People are hungry who are working full time, but don't earn a livable wage, or they're paying so much for their uh, rent or their housing, they, they can't afford food, um, or, or they have medical emergencies, or, or they live in what I call food apartheids, 
We don't call them food deserts because those are man-made. These are food apartheids where people don't have access to nutritious food. Uh, and so starting in the, uh, when President Obama became president, I started asking the then Obama administration, we should do another White House conference. Uh, pull all of government together, pull in the nonprofit sector, the faith-based sector, the private sector, any other sector that's applicable, and bring them in a room, and let's actually come up with a plan to, uh, to end hunger. Because to end this scourge is not just about one program or about one department. Um, because any hunger involves a lot of different other things. Um, and so we were not able to get it done during the Obama presidency, although we made some progress in a number of areas, mostly in terms of increasing uh, nutritional standards in school meals. Uh, and then we had four years where I was like, forget about it. And then now we're back. And, um, and before President Biden took the oath of office and the Speaker of the House asking, can you do this? Um, we, and we took us a few months uh, to kind of get them to, several months for them to say yes, but they finally did. Uh, and so this is, about, this is about coming up with a plan. And this conference really is just the beginning. I mean, the real work is in the implementation of policies. Um, just close with this. We live in the richest country in the history of the world. I mean, 40 million people who don't know where the next bill is gonna come from. I mean, I'm ashamed of that. As a United States Congressman, I'm ashamed of that as a, as a citizen. And I personally believe that food is a fundamental human right for every single person in this country and every single person on this planet. You know, we hunger, when all is said and done, is a political condition. And by that I mean we have everything. I mean, God, we have the money. We, we spend money on crazy weapon systems that, if we ever used them, would destroy half the world. Well, you know what, we have the resources, we have the food, we have the infrastructure, we have the knowledge. We, we've lacked the political will. And so Wednesday is about beginning the effort to get the political will at every level and in every sector so we can finally end this problem. Thanks. So let me pick up on that. The richest country in the world, whether Winton or Aaron or Gene, so why does food insecurity exist? You're closer to the ground working with people on it. Why? why? Why should we be talking about this in America? Yeah, I mean, I, I can speak to it. I, um, uh, you know, my mother, it was, you know, 30 years ago, made the really difficult decision to leave an abusive marriage, and we became food insecure overnight. It was simple math. The numbers didn't add up. She, her job wasn't paying enough money to support three kids. Um, so you pay the housing bills, you pay the heating bills, you pay for childcare, and what we know is families across the state and across this country are making trade-offs and they're deciding, what do I pay? You know, it's cold winters here in Massachusetts. Do I pay the heating bills or do I pay for food? And a lot of families decide to, you know, go without food. So it's, it's an economic condition. It comes down to not being able to consistently afford food and, and that's the main driver. And as Congressman McGovern said, it's not about working or not working. Um, people across our state and our country are working. In fact, some are working 80 hours a week and they still can't afford to pay the rent and pay the heating bills and pay the childcare and, and pay for food. Yeah, we see it every day at the Worcester County Food Bank and throughout our network of 119 partner agencies. Uh, it's basically an economic problem and how people arrive at that is very diverse. Um, but we hear from people saying, I had to go out and get a second job just to pay for the cost of food as a result of inflation. They were doing fine up until then, but with inflation, that's what put them over the edge, so. And the, the really interesting thing about that is that food is cheaper in America right now than it's ever been anywhere in the world in history. And we've artificially depressed the prices of food. 100 years ago, the average income worker had to work about two and a half hours in order to afford a chicken. And now they have to work about 15 minutes. And that's an average worker. And so, again, this is, as, as the congressman said, this is an issue of not having enough food. This really becomes an economic <coughs> issue. And when you look at the food system itself, food system workers are eligible for SNAP, food stamps, at a rate higher than any other industry. The number one food retailer in the country has more SNAP workers working for, more workers working for it who are on SNAP than any other company in the country. And so the people who are feeding us can't afford to eat themselves. 
And as, as, a, as an industry that employs about one in 10 workers in the country, that drives the economics of wages for just about every industry. And so it becomes this cyclical thing. So is it a matter, I know we produce a lot more food than we end up consuming. What's that proportion and how does that uh, impact? Do we, is, is it a matter of producing more food in America? No, because we actually have a, a wasting of food problem in this country along with hunger. We throw away so many billions of pounds of food every year that could go to help people. So I, I, think, it's like, I, think, I think it's like I think it's like forty yeah. percent of what we grow, uh, we we throw away, and um, perfectly good food, um, and um, you know, and we have a complicated system. Even you know, in our grocery stores with Best Buy dates, someday somebody will explain to me what they mean, because uh, I they 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 they. they you know, they don't make any sense. But nonetheless, um, you know, we have a lot of reputable markets and restaurants that actually dispose of food that's perfectly good because it's time to change the shelves or they just, they just do it as a matter of, uh, you know, of, of, uh, of practice. But, um, you know, we now have, you know, a lot of organizations that are springing up all across the country. Uh, Love and Spoonfuls is one of them here locally. I mean, I know Gene works with them and others, but, uh, but um, you know, they, they go out and try to recapture uh, what we would call food waste. And by the way, there's a lot of food waste on farms too. Um, and we have small farms that don't have the capacity necessary to store or refrigerate or, or to deliver it to people who need it. But that's one of the ways that uh, we can better combat hunger is, is, is utilize all this food that's perfectly good uh, that right now we discard. So I know we're talking about people who maybe uh, lack of food, food insecurity. How do I square if I said, well, obesity rates keep going up in America and we're talking about food insecurity? How, how do the two of those things go together? Or do I need to think about food insecurity more broadly? So the, the federal government subsidizes a lot of food, a, a lot of food in, in the production process. It started in 1933 with the New Deal and it has become the, the <laughs> In, I'm sorry, I'm going to get the numbers roughly right. In 2019, 39% of farm income in the country was from federal subsidies. And that was not for apples, tomatoes, healthy food. That was for corn and soy and sugar and things that go into processed food. And so you've got one part of the, of the federal government saying, farmers, produce more of this, and we're going to support you in producing more of this. We're going to protect you in times of drought and in times of other, other crises and things like that. And that's, I'm not saying necessarily that's a bad thing, but then you've got another side of the government saying, people need to eat more healthy food. And the healthy food gets a lot more expensive, and because the processed food, all the ingredients that go into the processed food are heavily subsidized, um, that food, those food prices are artificially depressed, and that's what people end up eating, and that causes the health problems you're talking about. Yeah, and I would add this is um, an issue for all Americans. I think often the conversation turns to low-income Americans and those who are on food stamps. But the data actually shows for men, you're more likely to become obese the wealthier you get. So I think it's just important to name that the obesity epidemic is an issue for everybody in the United States of America, not just low-income families. And exactly for, for the reasons that, that Winton pointed out, it's directly related to the affordability of certain foods. Um, and you know, for people on a low-income diet, especially, buying, and if you've got, like my mom, you know, three kids at home to feed, well, fresh produce was a lot more expensive than a few cereal boxes that, that you know, she knew the kids were going to eat. And so going back to those difficult choices, um, families that don't have a lot of economic means, they're going to choose the food that they know the family is going to eat because they only have so many dollars that month to spend. And unfortunately, in our country, for the reasons that Winton alluded to, um, processed food, unhealthy food is, is the cheapest. Let me, let me, if I just put it one thing, um, if you were to buy a bag of potato chips in the United States, and you would buy, and you were, then you went to Europe and you bought the same brand of potato chips there, there's less salt, less sodium content in the bag that you would buy in Europe than here, um, because they've, they've, they've underst they understand, uh, and they have legislated accordingly. You know that uh, you know they they, they want to make sure they're selling foods to people that aren't so unhealthy uh, that they're going to make people sick, and so again one of the things that we need to talk about, um, and you know is um, you know is 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 better labeling. And by the way, wh wh why do we make it so easy 
for junk food people to sell this junkier stuff. I mean, the reason why is because the saltier it is, it's kind of addictive. The more you're going to want more. Uh, I get that, but the cost of that um, is, you know, high blood pressure, heart disease, and a whole bunch of other issues. Uh, so uh, for everybody, low income, obviously, affording healthier food sometimes is more expensive. Um, stores push the junkier food oftentimes. But I mean, we need to get some, need to have some common sense. I mean, you can still have potato chips that taste good, that are salty, but they don't have to have the salt content of the Dead Sea. So we also used to teach nutrition in schools. We did, yeah. And so, I'd be interested in hearing. So from I'm going to ask. Phoebe's been teaching <laughs> yeah. education in public schools, and and I'll say I knew that. And last week Phoebe was in touch with me. I wanted to invite her to this and the dinner, and she's my advisee and came in and said, I want to talk to you about the White House Food Conference, and I assumed she meant today and. She meant going to the White House instead. <laughs> You've been doing uh, food education, so tell me how you saw this play out on the ground for young people in terms of. Uh, yeah, well, I think that a lot of people don't really know where their food comes from. I, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, so like I never went to a farm until my mom kind of forced me and my brothers to go like strawberry picking every year, which was, I don't know, probably when I was 15 or 16. So like when it comes to things like that just the food that is on your plate you don't really know where they come from like you don't have an understanding and you don't have a connection to that community and you don't have a connection to the farm or even where you don't understand the processes that have gotten the food to your plate so I think food education is so primal like it's so important to just be a part of like just when it comes to this conference I think educating the youth educating other people around us educating the community you kind of have to bring that in as well as you know eating healthier and making food more accessible. So how hard a lift was that in the schools when they said, here's the potato chips with more salt than the <laughs> Dead Sea, you can tell them, end quote. Or, or here's something else that's good for you. How did that work and how was it received in schools? Well, I think you can't really tell someone to cut out all unhealthy foods in general. Um, but I think eating in moderation, just learning about what makes your body feel good, I think that's very important. Like, obviously, if you feed a kid, like five Twinkies, he's not going to feel good after that. Um, but if you put like an apple in front of him and you make him kind of like have him compare, he kind of like the kid will understand that, you know, eating the apple will make his body feel better than eating the five Twinkies. I don't eat Twinkies. <laughs> so uh, we've got a lot of great organizations represented here. We have a great private sector, a charitable sector that works with that. Perhaps someone is thinking we have this amazing system of private charity in America. Uh, why should the government get involved in this? Why should this be at the White House? Shouldn't there just be, uh, you know, we've got the walk for hunger, we've got all these big things. Can't we just solve it that way? Yeah. So I'll, st I'll like to start because um, it, it, I, I'm taking my cue from Congressman McGovern over the years. Uh, organizations like the Worcester County Food Bank, we were started around 40 to 45 years ago uh, to support people through a temporary emergency need. And over the years, uh, we have become very good at managing the problem of hunger rather than solving it. And at the same time, people's needs have gone from being emergency and temporary to chronic. Um, after the Great Recession of 2009, uh, there was a study done that showed most people need to go to a food pantry to help them to meet a monthly shortfall in food. And so, you know, when you have people in front of you at your food pantry or at your food bank, of course you want to do everything possible to help them. But we shouldn't be doing it exclusively, and we can uh, do advocacy and work on those longer-term solutions to hunger because all of us up here know that hunger is a solvable problem. And if we could take all of those resources that go into keeping feeding programs and food pantries open. Think about all the volunteers, all of the financial supporters, all the food donors. If we could channel all of that power into the long-term systemic change that's needed for you know, real sustainable solutions, we can end hunger. And uh, charity and nonprofits cannot do this alone. There is such a role and an important role for our government. To, to stand up and say, no, this is an investment in our people in this country, and we should be linking food policy to economic policy and to health policy and education policy. So I think government, I think we've let government off the hook yeah. by talking about what a great job we do, and we let, you know, 
food donors off the hook and, and things like that. And we really, the government has to step up and take, um, take more action. And, you know, the, the, the community-based work that does really good, smart work to feed people in their communities informs good policy. And the state then can be an incubator for good policy at the federal level. And in Massachusetts, for example, we started a program a number of years ago called the Healthy Incentives Program, and where folks who are on SNAP can use that, their SNAP uh, benefits to purchase food at farmers markets and farm stands um, and, uh, and get money back on their card. So it's, we, don't, we don't like to call it free food, but essentially the economics of it turns out that way. And the state put together the program as a result of a lot of good advocacy um, and budgeted a certain amount for the program to run for three years and burn through that three years of money in about four months. And so we've put together a coalition, everybody on the stage is part of the coalition, and in the last five years have advocated and gotten the state to put up a total of $57 million in that time. Every dollar that goes into that program feeds people who otherwise wouldn't have had fresh food and goes to local farms to help sustain them, which who in turn help protect the environment and create jobs and, and, um, and, and support the local economy. So ideas like that can really be uh, fostered by nonprofits and by good advocacy coalitions and can then inform things like the White House Conference. I would also add, I mean, right now, 26% of families with children in Massachusetts are food insecure. Jean is incredible. She cannot feed one in four families in this state. That The charitable system is not meant to respond to a crisis of that level, one in four families. But you know what is? Where were kids today on a Monday? They were at school. And so right now in Massachusetts, every kid in Massachusetts at no cost is getting free school meals. So that is an example of a systemic solution for those 26% of families right now who are struggling to access and afford food. Knowing their kids can have two meals a day, that's an anti-hunger solution for those kids and, and it's, and it's beneficial, they're ready to learn when they um, are fed, but it's also an economic relief for the family, and that's money that, that, that those parents can now put towards um, to other expenses. So what I think you know, a big reason why Congressman has been so incredible championing for this com conference is that this is a crisis. I mean, this truly is. 26% of families in Massachusetts, richest country in the world, well, one of the richest states in the, in the country, this is a crisis, and it requires large-scale, big impact, and bold solutions to be put forward. So let's talk about that scale. Uh, what, uh, there are federal responses, state levels, perhaps local level, organizational levels. How do you divide up that work and responsibility? What, what do you look for from uh, the chair of the House Rules Committee or, or from the White House Food Conference? What, what's best left to you that maybe the federal government can't do? How do you think about that? Or maybe how do you think about it, Jim? Well, well, first of all, let me say that, um, you know, and I, I say this with love and affection for Jean McMurray and all the great work that she does at the food bank, but our goal ought to be to put food banks out of business. Yes. Right? I mean, that, that really is where we, I mean, the idea that, you know, that people have to rely on food banks and food pantries and, you know, all this stuff to be able to put, to support their families with, with nutrition, it, it really is not the model we should be striving toward, right? But thank God that she's there and that Aaron is there. Um, so that's, a, one is the responsibility is at all levels, right? And when you talk about ending hunger, the, the intersectionality with so many other issues, you know, comes into play. So again, it's, it's not just about increasing SNAP benefits. We ought to increase SNAP benefits, but that's not everything, Can right? Can you explain SNAP benefits? The SNAP is like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It used to be known as food stamps. Um, and up until recently, the average SNAP benefit was about $1.40 per person per meal. Under the Biden administration, we have increased it. Um, and with some of the uh, pandemic relief efforts, we have increased it as well. It's still not enough to be able to afford the meals that most of you enjoy. And by the way, we also know that there's hunger on college campuses. Uh, we've been doing hearings on that as well. Uh, and again, that hasn't been talked about in, until, until fairly recently. But we need, we, we need to look at this holistically. And, and you know, I, I met with every cabinet official in the Biden administration. And I sat down and I asked them, for them, asked them to participate and be part of this uh, and coming up with solutions. I sat down with Pete Buttigieg, uh, Secretary of Transportation. And he said, well, I, I agree with you on all this stuff, but like, I'm the Secretary of Transportation. What do you want me to do, right? I said, well, you know, transportation is an issue. People getting to places to get food or getting food to people 
um, in places that are away from everything. You live in a small town here, um, or you live in an area where you don't have access to public transportation to get you to any place. We need to be thinking about innovative ways to utilize transportation better to help solve this problem. Uh, Jennifer Granholm, the Secretary of Energy, why, with, what, what am I supposed to do with it? I said, well, we'll, we'll hold the issue of climate change for a little while, but utility costs, you know, they, they cut into people's food budgets. So you, you have a role to play. We have a hunger problem amongst new uh, recruits in our, our armed forces. You know, people you know, who are married get into the military, they get a, 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 a housing allowance to live off base if they have kids. That counts toward their overall income. They're ineligible for SNAP. And so they end up, there's food pantries near almost every military base in the United States. I mean, I go on and on and on. So we need to look at this more holistically. Um, and, and the final thing I'm gonna say is, we need to think about sustainable ways of moving forward. Ending hunger is also about community building. So if we're gonna be talking about how we can do it better here in, in Worcester, it's not, you know, it, it, it involves, you know, contracting out and working with our local restaurants. You know, let's help build them up, you know, uh, get the, their expertise to put, to put to good use to help end hunger in this, in, the, in, this, uh, in, in, in our uh, city. Let's, let, let's make sure we're, supporting our local farmers. Our food banks are now doing that um, much more purposefully than ever before. We want to support our local farmers because, as Winton pointed out, I mean, we have, he comes on, we do farm tours every year, and, you know, farmers are barely holding, they're just holding on, uh, you know, to survive. But the farm workers are even in worse positions. You work on a farm, you don't get child care services provided for you. You don't get a pension that you pay into. You don't get, you know, uh, you know, all these kind of benefits that you get in other jobs, right? So everybody has to put something on the table, and so does the private sector. So when I say it's an all of government and all of every sector approach, that's what I mean. And you alluded to, to scale, and the food system doesn't scale well. Right. Is that, you know, when, when transportation and refrigeration were, uh, were, were coming up in the early part of the last century, that was when we started looking more at profit and um, uh, efficiency and rather than actually feeding people. And so we moved all the animals out to where the grain is grown because it was less expensive. And we stopped looking at regional food systems and local food systems. And then we saw during COVID exactly how fragile those right. systems are, where the grocery store shelves were empty here and they were literally slaughtering chickens out in Minnesota because there was no market to sell them. And they were, they were piles of, of rotting produce in Florida. And so when you, when, you, when you don't look at the regional and local ways to make sure people are fed, um, you really lose something. And so this idea of bringing it to scale is always where, we start to, where it starts to fall apart. So if a governor were here coming in to visit, what would the governor say he needs? Does it vary by state to state? Where would the state level intervention be? Uh, well, in, in, in a number of areas, right? I mean, you know, the state administers these, these programs. Um, and the state comes up with innovative ways to build on the program. Winton mentioned the uh, Healthy Incentives Program. Um, and, um, and, we, and we want Massachusetts which, to do what California did, although Massachusetts just did it for an extra year. But we want universal free breakfast and lunch for every child uh, in every school in Massachusetts. So the state can, can lead on that. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the state can do a better job of connecting the dots you know, and working with people. And one something that Phoebe said, I, 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 this education part of the, this is so important. I don't know when, you know, in our education system, that it became okay to not teach all of us about agriculture, food, nutrition, and even how to prepare food. I mean, if you can prepare food, um, you can stretch your dollars. But, you know, I mean, it, it's not a priority. It should be, right? Um, every school ought to have a garden or a greenhouse if you're in Massachusetts because we have winters, right? <laughs> uh, we still have winters, notwithstanding climate change, yeah, but, uh, right. Um, but we, you know, I mean, uh, and you know, we ought, to, we ought to teach people about, about food and nutrition. I was in Harlem a few weeks ago. I visited a, a group called Harlem Grown. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I have. Yeah, <laughs> and it was, it, it, was, it was amazing. But it, it was amazing not just because of what they're doing now, but how they got there. 
And it was about this guy who initiated this, this program about kind of recapturing vacant lots in Harlem, growing good food, and his dream was, let's give it to kids in school to bring home to their parents. And in, and in this neighborhood in Harlem, I mean, a big percentage of the kids who go to school, you know, are, you know, are living in shelters. Um, and, um, you know, and amongst the others, they're, they're you know, they're, they're from very, very, you know, economically challenged families. So they grew all this fresh arugula and, and uh, eggplants and, you know, and all this great stuff. And he put it all in bags, he gave it to the kids, he said, bring it home. And then two weeks later, he went um, and he said, said to the, the, the students, uh, you know, well, well we, you know, what did your families think? And a lot of them said, my family threw it away. Uh, because not everybody is used to e eating arugula or even knows what arugula is or, you know, figure, what do you do with an eggplant? How do you, how do you cook? And because, you know, there was an issue of people living in chronic poverty for a very long time. And so he said, we got to do this differently, right? So, all of us, it, so we need to involve the kids in planting and helping to grow this stuff, tasting it, learning how to prepare it, bringing their parents in to help, you know, uh, to, to be part of cooking classes, hiring some of their brothers and sisters and, and even their parents to work in the gardens at a livable wage, you know, and, you know, and, 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 and working into the curriculum in school, some basic lessons on nutrition, food, and food pre preparation. Anyway, the result is phenomenal, right? It works, but the problem is to get it funded and get it scaled up to a point where it is not, oh, isn't this a unique, nice you know, project that you know, it, we see all the benefits. How do you do it all across the country knowing that it won't look the same in every part of the country? But again, a, a focus on that. So I, I mean, I'm a big fan of, 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 of what we, and also kids are teachers. You know, you know, I had kids, I, have, I still have kids, yeah. Um, but, um, you know, but I mean, you know, like every parent's dream would be that your, your child, when you're going to a supermarket, is asking you for, you know, carrots or celery rather than, you know, potato chips or, you know, you know junk food or candy. I mean, and so, and kids can also teach their parents um, who may not have been, who may have been robbed of good nutrition lessons, what good nutrition looks like. Yeah, so I believe that every school should have a food educator. Right. And what you described sounded a lot like my gap year yeah. in Connecticut and a lot of what I did. So um, a reason that I believe that food, that schools should have a food educator is because kids need to know about different things, starting with where their food comes from, how it's grown, where like different, you know, just other things like dairy and um, cheese, where all of that comes from as well, because that does also start on a farm. Right. Um, and so a large part of what I did in Connecticut was managing and helping maintain school gardens. And um, a lot of kids that did end up going out to the school gardens were also part of um, you know, different programs within their school where they needed a little bit more help. And some of the sensory gardens and sensory feelings that came from being outside, being working in these gardens, helped them tremendously with school as well. So I feel like everything's just all tied together. You have the food education piece, you have just being outside, the health piece, and just all of it ties back together to the community. And what is planted is based off of the community. Right. Um, you have your people that work there, you have the people that the community represents, and what is planted, things like Cilantro represents, you know, different communities, right. and you know, if you plant something that is for, let's say, like the Native American community, those kids will be, be able to have a voice at their school, and that everything just kind of ties together. And this used to be the norm, right. and now we're counting on nonprofits right. to to fund something like this. And you asked, when you don't know when it's when it's when they stop teaching this stuff, it's when frozen dinners became available in the grocery store. So you didn't have to know what things were and how to cut them up and cook them. And it's when there was a McDonald's and a Burger King being built on every street corner. That's when I was growing up. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. So there's over 100,000 schools in the nation, but obviously Food Corps can't put a food educator in every single one of these schools. So what do we do? I mean, like we do the best that we can. 
And now we kind of hope that the White House passes a whole bunch of policies that put food educators in schools. And Connecticut actually did pass a legislation recently that allows each school to have funding for a food educator. Winton, I'll ask you, are the, you work with local producers, I think. Are there, are, what are the ways that we can, or anybody who wants, what are the ways that we can encourage local production to work more effectively, efficiently? Uh, you, you talked about the problem of outsourcing to the Midwest. We, we talked about that. Uh, how, do we, how do we fix that system? It's all financial challenges, particularly in Massachusetts. Land is more expensive here than anywhere else. Energy is more expensive. Um, and, you know, we're dealing with climate change at the same, well, somewhat different rates, but, but similarly to everywhere else. And so when land is more expensive than it is anywhere else in the country, um, farmers have to pass that cost along to consumers. And ultimately, we, we want food that's grown in Massachusetts to be available to everybody. Um, but you can't do it when you're spending $35,000 an acre on, on land and you're dealing with the debt service for that and you're dealing with the development pressures of, of sprawl. Um, and so my focus right now is around farmland and trying to bring those costs down through state protection programs and access programs that are going to make farmland more accessible. Um, you know, and the, the other thing I'll say is education. There used to be a really robust um, uh, extension program based at University of Massachusetts. It's, it has about a third of the staff that it had 25 years ago um, to teach farmers how to deal with things like climate change, um, how to do simple things like budgeting, how to do soil management. You know, the extension service used, there used to be county agents who would go out and work in, on farms with, with, with the farmers on a daily basis. Um, and that's just gone. And so as a result, same thing as we were talking about with the food system and consolidation, the educators that are visiting farms are the fertilizer salesmen and the feed salesmen and the grain salesmen. And they may not have the farmer's best interest at heart. They may just be trying to sell a product. Anything else to say about the production side that we want to change? We talked a little bit about consumption, education, working with people there. What else to, to, what would you change? Well, I think there's a huge opportunity, but it's not easy. I remember uh, years, ago, you know, some time ago, um, everybody wanted to buy local. And, you know, uh, they were looking at the colleges and universities here in Worcester. You know, there's over 10 of them. There's the large healthcare system. They all wanted to buy local, but there wasn't the base for those farmers to provide all that food. Right. So there's huge opportunity, but there's, it's a steep curve to get there. But I think there could be so much synergy between local food, local um, hospitals, schools, um, to where really we could all be supporting each other and we hopefully could all be healthier with the locally grown food. Yeah, so the USDA has passed like a farm to school initiative, but the whole like, you know, obviously it's hard for schools to source food locally because you have to feed a lot of kids. Um, and I think that, you know, it, huge thing that should be talked about at the White House is just making that easier mm -hmm. for schools to get food from farms and make it easier for farms to sell school to food, sell food to schools. Um, and and, and just a little plug here, as long as we're talking about production, it's not just farms, it's fisheries as well. Massachusetts is the second largest fisheries state in the country. And every single thing we catch gets shipped out of state to be processed and then small amount of that gets brought back here to be sold. We don't have the processing capacity. And so again, it's this bizarre food chain where we focused on consolidation. And if we want jobs in the food system in Massachusetts and we want to keep that lo lo capture that local dollar here from local fish, um, we need to be investing in the infrastructure so that we can use stuff that's, that's produced here to feed people here. Let me just make two quick points. One is we also, uh, we, we need to insist uh, as a matter of policy that we better, that we support in a much more a meaningful way, good farming practices. Um, so that, you know, I mean, there is a difference between grass fed meat and meat that gets fed garbage uh, for our environment. How we protect our soil. I mean, are our farmers, you know, utilizing practices that are good, that will respect our soil and respect our environment? Because all of that is, is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. We ought to be more open to plant, to, to supporting, you know, more uh, investments in plant based foods. Um, and in terms of seafood, I mean, I talk to fishermen all the time who want seafood integrated into our school right. meals more. Like, we, 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 we have a coast here, and, and why don't we do that? Mm -hmm. um, but let me just say one final thing. It also requires heads of systems, whether it's colleges or universities or hospitals, or you name the system, 
to say, we want to change. You know, I, I, I've been a big advocate of trying to get our hospitals to focus more on nutrition and on food. And, and uh, you know, and, there's a, and to me, the model in Massachusetts is Boston Medical Center. Uh, I mean, they had they, the first hospital I know that had a food pantry. They provide people with, with food prescriptions. They, they have a garden on their roof. You can, I even, they even gave me Boston Medical Center honey from the bee farm <laughs> on the roof. It's really quite incredible. But the bottom line is they understand the linkage between nutrition and food and health and better outcomes. And, um, and I've, I've talked to hospital heads all over this country. Everybody's like, yeah, no, I, you're right, you're right, you're right. All right, but then do something about it. <laughs> then change the way you're doing things. You know, put a food pantry in. Improve the quality of food you serve in your cafeteria. Improve the quality of food you serve your patients. And by the way, good food, nutritious food, doesn't have to taste like cardboard. It tastes good if it's prepared well. So involve our chefs. I mean, but use your It just requires, again, the political will to say, we're going to do something differently here. You know, UMass um, Amherst, they, they, they have a program where all this incredible food, they do a lot of, I mean, they, some, I don't want to downgrade Holy Cross as a food service, but I mean, they always get rated like the highest and best food on college campuses across the country. They do a lot of local sourcing. But the food that they don't utilize, um, they get out to the community. And there's a relationship between the students and the food service providers on how to do that safely. I mean, we, every campus should do that, you know? Um, so we, we just have to just do it. Uh, you can't wait for the federal government to mandate everything. We just have to do it. I should know better what we do here to defend Holy Cross. But <laughs> let, me, let me ask another question, because you said 26% food insecurity in Massachusetts. If I were thinking of another country and I said, boy, 26% of people are food insecure, I would expect riots in the street, insecurity, of, of all sorts of other things. Why isn't this a political issue in America? I, I, I... Well, I mean, let me just begin by saying, I mean, what has to happen is that people need to hold their elected officials accountable. Mm -hmm. And we have people that vote for farm bills that basically hurt small and medium-sized farms, that, uh, that cut our, our food and nutrition programs like SNAP, and there's no political consequence. Yeah. I mean, the deal is, you know, I mean, you vote uh, for gun control and the NRA targets you and some people lose their election because they voted for gun control. You know, if you don't vote for a tax cut, you know, uh, the Chamber of Commerce will target you. You might lose your election. But if you vote to increase hunger in this country, if you vote to weaken the social safety net, more likely than not, you're not going to lose your election. And I really believe that, you know, that out of this conference might come a better awareness about the enormity of this problem uh, and the fact that we could actually do something about it. Um, and my hope is that that results in kind of this new activism around demanding change. We ought to be really impatient about this. And by the way, if you're hungry, you're hungry today. You can't wait five years or 10 years before we fix our systems in this country, it's, it's real right now. And if you've ever seen a hungry child, it is heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. I've been in to schools here in Worcester. My two sisters teach here in Worcester. I've seen kids, they, they tell me the kids come to school on Mondays having not eaten all weekend. And they go home on Fridays looking for food to take home with them. I mean, this is happening in our own city. Uh, and there ought to be an outcry. We ought to be ashamed we ought to be demanding immediate change, you know, and look, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, that, that political wave will come and, you know, and we will, we will do something meaningful and historical and transformational. Uh, and, um, you know, but people, people who are hungry, you know, are worried about putting food on the table for their kids. They don't have time to write out postcards to their elected officials or lobby the state legislature or, or fly down to Washington or you know write letters to the editor. I mean they I mean they have all they can to do to just put food on the table. I will tell you, my kids never went hungry. If I had to wake up every morning wondering how am I gonna put food on the table for my kids, I'd be out of my mind. So it's up to us to pick up 
uh, the mantle here and to, and to create the political will to get our leaders to move in a different direction. And I, I would add that I think at one time, people who depended on charitable feeding programs, um, they might have been um, you know, not working. But as the economics have changed, it's really more and more people. And you know, there's a lot of stigma around um, being you know, poor, being food insecure. And that's a lot of reasons why sometimes people won't ask for the help that they, they deserve, frankly. But I have, over the, like, the last 20 years, I have had people come up to me and say, I never knew someone who was hungry, but now it's my neighbor, right. or it's my cousin, or it's me. And I think once we can put um, a human face on it and not just think of it as an other, somebody out there, but it's right here. It could be someone you're sitting next to in class or riding on a bus with. It's, it's that real, it's that close to home. The stigma but, I, but, question I, but I think is we helpful. have a, a, a um, we've as a country, we've come to accept some level of hunger that should be so unacceptable. The stigma point is helpful because you know the next election may rise or fall on gas prices, mm -hmm. but hunger we seem willing to accept, and right. we, it is some decision that that we're allowed to make. I want to open it to student questions, and maybe while student we have a microphone up here, students are. Welcome to make a question or a comment after Paul turns it on. But just as, as they're thinking about their questions, let me ask you, uh, what's to keep this White House event, certainly you're gonna shine a spotlight on it, what's to keep it from becoming Wednesday's event and then Thursday's gonna be about gas prices and Friday's gonna be about something else? Uh, what, there's a political strategy behind this, I trust. Yeah. Uh, so what is that strategy? How does that move us? to the future for you? Well, it, it's all of us, right? I mean, I mean, we have to, we have to insist on the follow-up. Um, and if they're not following up, we have to call them out uh, and tell them that you're not doing what we expected you to do. I mean, it's really, it's really that simple. Um, and Particular I mean, legislative plan? Well, th there will be, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously, th I mean, there will be a legislative strategy. Uh, there will be a strategy for states and cities and towns. There'll be a strategy for the private sector, the nonprofit sector. We're all going to have to, yeah, we're going to have to meet again, uh, and we're going to have to see, did you do what you said you were going to do? Uh, did you complete your assignment or not? And I just want to say one thing before we go to questions about stigma. You know, I sit on the Agriculture Committee as well, and every farm bill, uh, when we talk about the SNAP program, you know, somebody will say, well, just get a job. That's all you need. There's a lot of jobs. And I, I, and, I, and I always cringe because we're the committee that oversees the program. And so you'd like to think that everybody on the committee at least knows the basics of how the program's working and who's on the program. But here's the fact that you should, you know, if anybody says that to you, you should keep in mind. The majority of able-bodied people on SNAP who, are, who can work, the overwhelming majority work. But they still qualify for SNAP. The others are like children. I guess you could repeal the child labor laws and force little kids into, you know, uh, forced labor. Or, or senior citizens. I mean, you can send grandma back to the factory. I don't, I don't know, I'm right? But of the eight, of people who, who are able to work, the overwhelming majority work. And that says something, you know, that's wrong in this country, whereas, you know, if you work, you ought to not have to live in poverty. You ought to be paid a livable wage. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, but people are working. They're working harder than ever, and they're still in need of help, whether through the food banks, or Project Bread, or they rely on, you know, the, the, thank God our kids are getting meals in school, you know, or whatever. I mean, so, you know, the, the, the narrative out there that sometimes people put out, push to not do anything, to justify not doing anything, is not the reality. And it just, they just throw that out there. Yeah, I was a, I was a history major at Holy Cross, so I, I love history. And, um, you know, in coordination with the conference this week, Project Red's putting out two research briefs this week and on both of these topics. And one is on this narrative around work. And there was a time, you know, post-World War II, when if you got a job, it was your ticket out of poverty. And research showed it. It's just not the case anymore. If you're working in the food sector, as Winton alluded to, Working 40 hours a week is not your ticket out of poverty. 40 hours a week means you are living paycheck to paycheck in debt and not able to afford food. So we have to deconstruct this false narrative that we have in the United States of America that a job is the ticket out of poverty. 
And the second piece is, is really, re why are we accepting of this 26.2% you know, of families with children in Massachusetts being food insecure? And Jane spoke about it, but a big part of it is the narrative around this issue being a charitable mm -hmm. cause. And, and we have charts showing that you know, as the <coughs> federal government disinvested in some core strategies, you saw the charitable sector have to pick up. Um, and a lot of people, and I think really smart people, I go to dinners with my Holy Cross friends, really smart people who care about it, when they hear about this issue and they know the organization I run, they think, what can I do? Should I, like, should I get canned foods and, and donate that? And I say, no, do not. We have to deconstruct this narrative that you can solve this crisis through canned food drives. You can't. I say, you've got to pick up the phone. You've got to make this a top legislative issue. And that's the reality. I mean, we, I haven't met yet any elected official who's run on a pro-childhood hunger campaign. But I do often hear in Massachusetts, I'll talk to an elected official, and they say, yeah, yeah I'm all on board. I'm going to be at the turkey event on Thanksgiving. Right. And I say, hey, we don't need you there. 88% of the people that we work with don't have a functioning refrigerator. They can't even store that, that, refriger that turkey. <coughs> what I actually need you to do is to co-sponsor legislation to, to give free school meals to all kids in Massachusetts. And then they say, well, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not convinced yet. You know, convince me on it. And so we have to realize this is not a charitable response. When 26% of families in Massachusetts can't feed their kids, there is no charity that can respond to it, and, and we've seen a huge disinvestment in the federal government because of this narrative that, that the charitable sector will pick up yeah. on it. Yeah, but, if yeah. food banks could have ended hunger, we would have done it by now, and we haven't, and we, we're, we've been around now for 45 years. Yeah, so. and like, there's so many different like, legislations that says, like, by 2060. But like, by 2060, you know, the kids that are hungry now are, are going to be hungry. And food is a fundamental human right, and that's something that needs to be fixed now. It's not and, something that can wait. It's not right. something that we can put off. And, and you asked why you know, this th th seems masked, and it's not, it's not something people are aware of. And we're fixing it with all the money we're pouring into the medical system. We're, we're medicating people who, in, instead of them having food, access to food and being healthy that way, we're saying, well, we can fix that through the, through the, through the medical system. And so those costs to the, to the medical industry have gone up. It doesn't look like hunger in the same way that we're used to seeing it. And when we see it on TV or in, in, in stories or whatever it may be, it's very different. It has less to do with caloric in, intake. It has more to do with the fact that people are, are getting food that's making them sick. And we're covering that up with the medical system. So I've heard from all these colleagues about the great class of 2026 and what great questions they ask in their Montserrat seminars. Now tell me those weren't all students assigned to the other clusters? Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> That's a dare. Somebody, please come up to the mic. Even make a line there. I'm happy to see, you know. Hi, Congressman McGovern. Um, earlier, you had mentioned, you had made a distinction between food desert and food apartheid. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, deserts uh, are kind of natural, right? I, I'm thinking of like, you know, the Sahara Desert, right? Um, uh, but um, but uh, apartheids are inflicted on people by other people. Uh, and, um, you know, I, because, uh, you know, I visited areas uh, where there is plenty of food um, in neighboring, you know, neighborhoods that could be brought into a neighborhood where there's, uh, there, is, uh, there is no access to fresh produce, for example, uh, but it doesn't happen. It's purposeful. Um, and um, you, know, there are, you know, there are people who live in neighborhoods where they don't have, have access to a supermarket or, or a farmer's market or whatever, right? And all they, they have to rely on these little bodegas or little you know, co corner shops where if you smoke cigarettes or wanted frozen pizza, you, know, you're, you, know, you died and went to heaven. But if you wanted to get, uh, you know, anything like a tomato or a or carrots or whatever, you, th there's nothing there, and so um, you know that's a challenge um, in terms of uh, food affordability, and it's a challenge in terms of access to nutrition. In Washington D.C., we've been working with uh, D.C. Central Kitchen, and because uh, we're trying to get supermarkets to go into these neighborhoods that what we call that I call food apartheid, and it's really hard. I mean. It, and we're going to have to figure that out. But in the meantime, we've been working to try to subsidize 
um, refrigeration that could be put in the middle, you know, or uh, in small areas of, the, of, of these little small corner stores and to have local farmers provide fresh produce that people could buy with their SNAP benefits or uh, the, 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 the DC Central Kitchen helps subsidize them so they're at a lower price. But um, when we talk about ending hunger, it's not about just, here, take this. It is about giving you choice and it's about giving you choice for nutritious, healthy foods as well. Um, you know, and uh, because we don't want to end one problem, create another. Uh, and uh, that's why nutrition is part of this conference. And I just want to add that it's not just an urban problem, but here in Worcester County, like um, the farthest northern area, like Winchenden, beautiful farmland, but they don't have a supermarket. So people have to go over to the line in New Hampshire to get to the nearest supermarket. And a lot of people, senior citizens, don't have cars, so they have a van that brings people there. So. Uh, hunger and food insecurity looks very different depending on where you live. It's, it's urban, suburban, and, and rural. Yeah, and to give you another example, um, I worked with the Yukon Extension Group to kind of map out where our food apartheid are and, and like where our food banks are and where our bus systems are. And we see that like there's such a huge, like there's such a huge diff like distance between where you know our bus stops are and where our food pantries are. Mm -hmm. It's things like that. Thank you Thank very you. much. So I have a question for Congressman McGovern. Um, so you guys mentioned throughout the um, dialogue here that you are in favor of more of a government intervention to, for, to end uh, food insecurity. So how would that necessarily look like? Um, how would the government get the funds to do this sort of programs? Would that be through cutting certain programs and reinvesting that money to, you know, providing for more um, food security across the state? on a state level, or is that going to be accomplished through taxation of some sort? Well, first of all, um, I do think we need to spend more money um, on some of these programs. But I would argue, and we're having these conversations now with the Congressional Budget Office, which scores these bills, tells you how much they're going to cost. And they also tell you w whether these programs provide savings. I would argue that some of the things that we're talking about would provide more savings and would pay for themselves. For example, universal school meals, I think, will result in kids actually doing better in school it will also lower the incidences of, of, of health problems. Medically tailored meals to follow you when you get dismissed from a hospital uh, will save a boatload of money for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, we're told that one of the number one reasons why people get readmitted to a hospital prematurely is because of lack of nutrition. So why don't we, why don't we, why don't we help underwrite some of that? Medicare and Medicaid should be able to do that. And, and by the way, insurance companies should want to do it too because they don't want to pay for you in the hospital. So a meal is a, is a, lot, is a lot cheaper. Um, but the avoidable health care costs, lost productivity in the workplace, you know, better results in schools, I think result in enormous savings. Um, and, um, you know, and then look, um, and, if, and, and if that doesn't cover everything, then yes, we should cover more. I mean, nobody ever asked me, like, where do we get the money to build another nuclear missile? Um, when we have more nuclear weapons, we could destroy the world multiple times over. You know, nobody ever asked me, like, oh, how are we going to pay for that tax cut for corporations? I mean, we just do it. But then we get asked, for, like, how, do you, how are we going to afford this? I'm telling you, we, can, we cannot afford the status quo. Hunger is costing us in so many ways. Ch was it Children's Health Watch? Did a study, maybe, Aaron, you remember that, what was the? I think it was 240 billion? Yeah, for I'm Massachusetts. Not a great I'm not, yeah. For Massachusetts yeah. alone, billions and billions and billions yeah. of dollars in costs that we are all paying to deal with the hunger crisis here in Massachusetts. So wouldn't we rather just deal with the hunger crisis, save that money, you know, put it toward whatever we need to do to end the hunger crisis, and the leftover, you know, invest it in things that we, that we think are worthwhile. Honestly, like the school like lunch system is a ten billion dollar like industry. Why not use the money that we're using right now to make better choices? Like, thank you. All right. I don't know. I just wanted to follow up. Just like, okay. if I'm understanding it correctly, so investing money into um, you know helping people being out, being able to have access to food will 
end up alleviating certain costs yeah. throughout the state um, and actually helping us, you know, save money. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Good evening, panel. Uh, thank you for showing up and discussing this issue. Um, my question pertains to the conference that's coming on Wednesday, um, and I know we have two in an audience today that will be there. And is this an issue of bipartisanship, or is this not an issue? And why hasn't the other side been called out on it? So we, we, it should be a bipartisan issue, um, and um, and we went out of our way to um, when, when we did the formal request to make it a bipartisan request. So. Um, I, I took the lead. I got Senator Cory Booker, a Democrat from New Jersey, to be the, um, uh, the, the Senate lead on the Democratic side. Senator Braun of Indiana, Republican, uh, also signed on. And Congresswoman Jackie Walorski, a Republican from uh, Indiana, signed on as well. Uh, sadly, she was just recently killed in a, in a tragic automobile accident. But the request went to the White House as a bipartisan request. And by the way, you know, when we talk about the previous White House conference, um, you know, there were bipartisan voices that came together in that. My, my first job in college was as a college intern for Senator George McGovern of South Dakota, liberal Democrat from South Dakota, great last name. Um, <laughs> but uh, this was one of his big issues. He teamed up with Bob Dole, a conservative Republican from Kansas. Together, they came together and they, they they helped, act, hunger was being, we were reducing hunger during the 1970s, believe it or not. Um, and uh, in large part because of their efforts. So I want this to be a bi bipartisan issue. And um, you know, and unfortunately, some of these issues that we were talking about, whether it's SNAP, um, or whether it's, you know, uh, strengthening other nutrition programs, have unfortunately become partisan because I think the narrative has not accurately re reflected the reality, but uh, yeah, this is this is this is an issue of humanity. This is who are who are we? I mean, if this is not if, if making sure people have enough to eat is not something that can bring us all together, then God, I don't know what the hell you know would. You know, you don't have to agree on everything to agree on something. This is the something we all should agree on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, panel. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, today, I really appreciate uh, all of the incredible information that we've discussed. Um, I had a question regarding sort of corporate intervention in food courts across the country, particularly in schools, entirely in schools, really. Um, a lot of school, school districts and other sort of school education-based organizations have turned to corporations, uh, especially fast food corporations, in order to provide food uh, for their for their schools, essentially, and that has contributed significantly to the rise of obesity, as well as the other sort of aspects, such as the increasing proliferation of unhealthy sort of snack programs or that sort of thing. Uh, do you believe that sort of corporations have no role in the continued solving of the hunger crisis in the United States, particularly in sort of this area of education? Or, and if not, what sort of policies should be pursued to make it so these corporations can contribute in some way positively, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. I'm, I fear I've not made, I've not spoken no, properly. I, I, mean, I, I, mean, I mean, I would just say, and Phoebe, you should speak to this. I mean, scratch-based cooking is the best option for schools. There's no question about it. Having school nutrition directors be able to prepare the menu, cook the food on site, it's healthiest, kids like it the best. Um, but the reality is a lot of kitchens, especially here in Massachusetts, a lot of schools were built before World War II. And before World War II, the ex expectation were the kids were going to go home and eat lunch. So they don't have cafeterias. And installing cafeterias in schools is incredibly expensive and incredibly challenging. And so what you find is there's a lot of districts that they have to figure out another way. And a lot, a lot of times they have somebody deliver the food to it and then they have to warm the food up and they give it to kids. So it's not ideal. Um, there's been a lot of efforts across Massachusetts and I think across the country to figure out unique ways to get those kitchens to be able to build in some sort of kitchen equipment for if they don't have it um, on site already. So that, that's a big part of it. And um, as far as corporations, I think it's just a big word. It's kind of you know, they have to have a vendor is really to bring that food when they're not able to, to provide it. So there's all different sorts of vendors and everyone chooses different vendors based on, you know, financial decisions, which 
I'll close with, which is directly tied into universal free school meals. By having universal free school meals, you bring in more money to the schools. They're at, be at, better able to make um, you know, better decisions about quality of food and nutrition of food when they have more money to spend on, on purchasing it. So yeah, so back to the kitchen thing. Um, working at a school, like working in schools, um, even when there is a kitchen, like a lot of the equipment is not up to date and it's not able to you know, feed the thousands of students that are going to school there. And I feel like there's a little misconception when it comes to our school meals. Um, the USDA has passed legislation that requires a specific you know, diagram when it comes to how much we eat when it pertains to fruits, vegetables, protein, things like that. Let me, let me just say, you know, um, I mean, so there's the school meal stuff, but we have some bad corporate players that push junk food like crazy on everybody. Um, and so kids of all ages, adults of all ages, uh, tend to, you know, get taken in by them. But we, but you know, I, I think what we need to try to, uh, to stress is that um, as this whole issue of food sovereignty is becoming uh, more prominent, and that, that is that people want to have some control over what they put in their bodies. Uh, that actually, if you are a big food corporation or a soda company, whatever, and you're looking down the road, you know, you might be, you might, you should be asking yourself questions now. Really, where is the market base going to be five and ten years down the road? Some of the soda companies are already figuring this out. They're they're making less and less sugary drinks and more and more flavored waters because they know people, are, are, you know, are not buying soda as much as, as much as they used to. So I mean. So there, there may be some areas where, you know, I mean, because corporations are all making money um, and they don't always put your welfare front and center, but there may be some, some areas where corporations feel that they can make more money by doing what's right by students and by everybody uh, in terms of food. And, and, uh, and that's where better labeling also needs to come in and better education needs to come in. Uh, so that people know what they're buying uh, and know what's good for them and know what's bad for them. Let me just say this. You go into a supermarket right now and you want to make good choices. And, you know, we, we all say that a tomato is a good thing and celery is good, you know, the fresh vegetables. But then you start looking at products that say things like natural. And my mother bought something that said natural. She goes, oh, this must be organic. No, it's not. Well, it must be good for you because it says it's natural. No, it's not. it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and if you read the label, if you're a chemist and you can understand the labeling, it's really, this particular product is really, really bad for you. I mean, we need to make it easier for consumers to be able to have the information about nutritional content in a way that they can understand it and in a way that is meaningful. Uh, and so we may have to push the corporations a little bit on that. And Aaron, how much do the schools get uh, financially for each meal? Oh, it's like 35 cents for breakfast and like 65 cents for, I, I don't know, I'm not the numbers person, but it's nothing. It's, it's under not, a buck. Yeah, yeah. it's so nothing. So when's the last time anyone here had a good meal for 65 cents? <laughs> yeah. but so it, it does come back to money. And, yeah. and again, talking earlier about scale, you know, these, these big corporations are able to do things on a scale where they can bring those costs down by exploiting environmental uh, resources, by exploiting their workers and all of that, but there's also efficiencies built in. And that's the way the schools have to go when they're only getting 65 cents per meal. And I have a bill to increase the reimbursement yes, rate for students. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And um, one more thing, connected to that, uh, there's been a recent development, uh, particularly in the line of either sort of plant-based meat, meat, uh, meatless products or synthetic products grown in labs. In fact, uh, very recently, actually, the largest meat growing sort of facilities have actually been begun construction in the U.S. right now. Do you think that this sort of alternative sourcing for important sort of protein sources and other nutritional things, things um, do you think that those sorts of avenues for scientific development would be good ways to drive down the um, sort of not only the price of goods, but also the amount of space taken up by, say, cattle raising, and instead that can be used for alternative means such as growth of food or other sort of things, I guess? Well, look, at I, I'm, you know, so I'm more familiar with the plant based um, food movement, uh, which I'm actually pretty enthusiastic about. Um, because everything is done naturally. I mean, it's, it's you know, um, and uh, I, will, I will die, uh, to the day I die, I will, I will still eat a hamburger, 
uh, but I do think that uh, there is merit in, um, um, in, in uh, f focusing more attention on plant-based foods as a, as, a, as, a, as a way to the future. And again, it's everybody's taste. The other stuff I'm not so familiar with, I get nervous about um, you know, altering things in a way that just seem a little unnatural. Um, I understand the uh, environmental impacts that, that people have raised, but I just don't know enough about, you know, producing a, a steak in a right. petri dish and, you know, I, mean, I, I so I, but on the plant-based food stuff, I'm a little more familiar with it and I'm, I, I you know, I'm, and I kind of like what they're doing. They're employing a lot of farmers too, by the way, you know. Thank you. I know we have four questions right, and I know we have to get you on a plane to Washington yeah, DC tonight. Yeah, yeah. So let's make sure we do those. Hi, I'll keep this quick. Um, this is an open question for uh, anyone, but um, what ideas or plans do you have for uh, making sure that farmers and farm workers uh, can make livable wages and are able to buy the nutritious food that they're presumably growing uh, and making that plan sustainable through inflation, recessions, things like that? <laughs> Honestly, this gets into a very deep economics question. It mm -hmm. has to do with the fact that food is, uh, is underpriced. And I was talking about this earlier, that, that we don't, we've gotten used to underpriced foods to the point where I know someone in Central Mass who grows hay strictly for the livestock industry, but they get all of their beef from Walmart because farmers can't afford to buy the food that they're raising themselves. So I wish I had a good answer for you. You're asking a great question, um, but it really does hinge back on that Thing that I keep harping on about that we've focused on economies of scale and on profit. Um, and you know, this gets actually to the, to the previous question as well. We've moved away from eating the food that's available to us in our communities, in our regions, and to, to the point of eating food because you go to the grocery store and you can get anything from anywhere in the world. And that is what's hurting local farmers um, and because it's, it's driving down the prices of everything. So it's, it's it's a huge issue, and it, it gets into farmland costs, it gets into labor costs, it gets into education, everything that we've been talking about up here. But you're right, that's really at the core of it. Farmers in Massachusetts, for every dollar they spend on producing food, they earn 94 cents. Again, I'm not an economist, but that sounds bad. But as we just said, I mean, maybe if we, if farmers and farm workers have kids, right? Maybe we bring the child tax credit back mm -hmm. uh, to help uh, alleviate, you know, some of the financial burdens that they have. Um, you know, uh, there are other, you know, uh, incentives and other programs that we can help expand. Um, you know, Winter talked earlier about how we subsidize, you know, some bad things in our agricultural system. Maybe we ought to be thinking about, you know, some sort of a, a you know, a, a nationwide retirement system for people who are farm workers. Healthcare. I mean, healthcare as well, right? Helping with the healthcare costs. Um, and uh, so, I mean, there, there are some things that we need to do, but it's a real issue. And what, like I said, we were just on a, a farm tour. We heard a lot about the fact, you know, that if you're working on a farm, I mean, you know, I mean, we're all human. At some point, you know, you can only, you, you know, you, this hard work that you do every day, at some point it has to cease, probably earlier than if you were working behind a desk. Um, and so, you know, there's, but we need people to do this, right? We need people to do this. So we need to, if we're not going to pay more for food, we need to find other ways to subsidize some of the uh, services and support systems that are necessary. Thank you. Great question. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Um, there's been a lot of discussion on the emphasis of the local nature of our food system. However, the U.S. is a large exporter of beef, wheat, and corn. The global nature of our food system impacts the local food, and to that end, looking at Ukraine and Russia, being the second and eighth largest producer of grain respectively, both have a massive impact on local prices. How does a domestic hunger strategy coming out of this conference tie into the international nature of our food system? Well, I'm not sure that question is going to be answered at, the, at, this, at this conference. Oh, come on. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, no, but the, um, no, uh, but look, um, the, 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 the way this kind of system works, I mean, it's not so much that we're getting the grain from Ukraine, but uh, Africa depends on it. Uh, the Middle East depends on it. If they can't get it, then they have to get it from someplace else, right? And then you see prices begin to increase. Um, and so, look, I mean, you know, we, 
you know, it would be nice to have a more stable world, um, uh, but we're, you know, and you know, we, but we can't count on that. Uh, so, um, and we produce an awful lot here. I mean, I, it's not that, and, and to the extent we could produce more, we, we probably do if the world doesn't uh, settle down. But, um, but it's kind of a chain reaction. I mean, it's kind of like gas prices. And I mean, we, we have only so much control over it, but what happens globally um, has a direct impact on it. And, um, and I will say that you know, this conference is focused on hunger here in the United States. Um, but um, I, I saw a statistic the other day that every four seconds, somebody dies from hunger in this world. Um, more people die of hunger than from war. Uh, and um, you know, again, that's a, that's a sobering statistic. And it should compel us to be having this conversation on a, on a, on a global scale. Um, Food has been weaponized by certain countries and certain leaders, uh, and um, uh, but uh, you know, but but th but that that will probably be beyond the purview of this of this conference. But it's an important topic. Thank you. Hi, right, thank you for coming. Uh, my question is concerning like the nutritional education. You all addressed how that has decreased a lot in the school system. And my question is, how can we as students or even high school students do something that can encourage the implementation of the level of education that is needed to indoctrinate the current and the upcoming generations about nutritional values and how we can implement that into our life? I mean, out of high school, I worked as a food educator for Food Court in East Hartford. So I think, um, obviously, you could go down that path, um, you know, volunteer. and. It is a paid position, so you could get paid for it as well. Um, work for Food Corps. Like, edu food education is super important, as you know. Um, so obviously, you should also read up on it. Like, you should learn about your food systems. You should learn about the community that you're in as well. And like, we could do that here at Holy Cross, right? Like, we're in kind of like a secluded area. Like, we're all in one campus. And I feel like, you know, within the city of Worcester, we can learn a lot about the food systems in the city of Worcester. I would add, never underestimate the power that you have, that um, high school students have to change things. I come from a small town in Whitensville, um, Massachusetts, and it was a young woman who challenged um, the school about school debt. You know, she, um, her family couldn't afford to pay for her school meals and so they went into debt, and she spoke out about it. And it's, I, Project Bread worked with this young woman as well. Um, and she got things changed, um, which led to uh, legislation at the State House. So I think it's really, you know, talking to school committee members um, and saying, and, and, and advocating to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, you have power, and it starts, you know, with building relationships and having conversations, and letting people know this, these things are important to you and to um, other people like you. You want to see change. I met with the superintendent today, the new superintendent of Worcester Public Schools, and we talked about this, um, and she seemed open to new ideas. We ought to work on the school committee. Um, you know, I mean, it, it really is. We just, we just got to do it, right? You don't have, to, you know, you can integrate nutrition lessons in math and science. It doesn't, you know, you don't have to have a separate period. And, I mean, you could do it in a multiple, multiple ways. You know, as I said before, I said at the beginning, you could become a, a doctor in this country and not have to take a course in nutrition. And I met with the top heads of all the medical schools in the country, uh, this was a few years ago, and I said, can you tell me why? Give me, why don't, why don't you teach a course in nutrition? Why is it just covered, you know, just kind of quickly, maybe in another course? And you know what the answer they gave me was? Because it's no, there are no questions on the medical boards. Right. I'm like, that's a stupid answer. <laughs> I really, I wish I had a better answer than that. You know, I mean, maybe we need to have, you know, questions on the MCAS. I mean, you know, to, to force school systems to do this. But it makes no sense that we're not emphasizing this. You know, I mean, and um, you know, it's a win-win-win for everybody, but it's just, and, and, and I think we're getting to the point where, I, where I'm tired of people yesing me to death. Like, oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Then what are you doing about it? And to, to the point of, of food touches everything. 
it's such a great topic because it, 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 you don't have to be a food studies major or something like that. So if you're an economics student, there's a lot of good food stuff to be studying and we need more e economists who understand how the food system works. If you're studying international studies, the question that the person asked earlier was a brilliant question mm -hmm. and that's something you could be looking at. No matter, and certainly if you're studying public health, that's something that you could be working on. And so if you're interested in this, but you've already chosen your path or your major, or you think you know what you're focused on, there's ways to weave food into everything you're doing. And the second thing I'll say is everyone should take Professor Stasniak's class. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. Hi. Um, so in the panel, you guys mentioned broken fridges, rent prices, and large corporations contributing to world hunger. How will you convey ending world hunger to legislators if the issue goes way farther than food? Um, if all those roadblocks exist, how will we end hunger? Well, I would just say that, again, the purpose of this conference is to bring all these different kind of entities together. So not, I mean, you know, we usually in Congress, when we talk about hunger, it's like the USDA, you know, and the Agriculture Committee, you know, um, and it is much, much more than that. And so we want some of the private sector players to come to the table. Uh, people who we may not have always seen eye to eye on. Maybe there's some commonality here. Um, you know, we want other people, you know, who might have a, whether, you know, like I said, reach out to the Secretary of Transportation. Transportation is a factor in all of this. Uh, we, want him, we want him to be at the table. We want everybody who has something, the farmers to be at the table, the, 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 the school uh, principals, the, you know, you name it. We want everybody at the table to figure out how we can do this. You know, I mentioned earlier about uh, uh, college campus, uh, uh, hunger on college campuses. And I did a hearing on it. Um, and it's amazing, you know, that uh, there's not a, I mean, at, at some of the most prestigious colleges in the, in the world, there's a hunger problem. <coughs> and people are trying to come up with ways, how do you deal with it? First of all, students who are hungry who are at colleges don't know where to go. So we need to have people, when they come in, you know, ask the appropriate questions in a respectful way to find out whether people might be food insecure. But secondly, there's all kinds of solutions out there. I, mean, I don't know what, what it is here, but uh, you know, when I went to college, you, 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 could have, you get a meal plan. And you know, every time you get a meal, you that charge you or you check a box, but you'd pay for the meals in advance. Well, in some schools, what they're doing, knowing that if you're like me, you know, you didn't eat every meal um, on, on, uh, in the cafeteria. And so the ones that you don't use, you could turn in at the end of the week and it could be given to somebody who might need it. I mean, that's like, th there were some, there are ideas out there that uh, where, you know, we could actually solve things maybe in a smaller way, but all of it, all of it adds up. But the point I'm trying to make is that we, we, have a, we want a diverse group of people at the table, including people with lived experiences. And, I'm, and I think everybody could put something on the table. And if we do that, we could have a plan and we could go out and we could then implement it. And those people that are more difficult to deal with, well, that's where <laughs> we all gather together. We put pressure on them uh, for them to move. But this is solvable. This is solvable. This is, I mean, I mean, all of us up here know, that's what, this, what makes this topic so maddening, is that it's like some things I don't know how to, you know, I don't know how to solve some world problems we have. This is one that is solvable in my lifetime. Um, and by the way, not in my lifetime, I'm hoping I'm gonna live longer than 2030. Um, but um, <laughs> but, but if, if we, we, this is solvable in this country by 2030. And I would just, yeah, yeah. add, I mean, I, um, I get asked this question a lot, right? Because like the, the wages and, and that's contributing to it, cost of childcare, cost of transportation. And I go back to my own personal story. And I know that, you know, you know, Project Bread as an organization and the anti-hunger leaders on this table couldn't have solved all my mom's problems. She was facing domestic violence and economic challenges. But what she didn't need to worry about was feeding her kids. That we could have solved. If she could have sent her kids to school and they got two meals a day, that alone would have given her the cushion to just stay afloat. Or if, her, if our pediatrician had asked, 
when we met with the pediatrician, are you reliably getting food at home? And if the answer was no, we could have put solutions in place. And so that, that's why this is solvable. There are definitely so many factors contributing to it, and I'm committed to solving those as well. But as we've said, there's more than enough food to feed everyone. We have the programs, we have the policies, we have the resources. It's a matter of what Congressman McGovern has done, which is bringing everyone together, talking about it, and building the political will to actually just make it happen. And we all chose food, but you could have five people up here to talk about affordable housing or education or public health. And the challenge is, and what Congressman McGovern is trying to, to solve, and this is a bigger problem than hunger, honestly, is the siloing of all these issues. The fact that food is connected to transportation, is connected to public health, is connected to education, is not a bad thing. It doesn't make it harder to solve. It makes it easier to solve. And so a panel up here of a person from education, a person from public health, a person from housing, a person from food, that's, that's where you start to actually get some, some richness of conversation and figure out it's, it's not a zero-sum game. They can actually all be helping each other, and hopefully that's what Wednesday is going to happen. We're going to start doing. Thank you. I want to thank each of you for your work. Thanks, so. uh, Jean, Aaron, Phoebe, Winton, and Congressman Jim. Uh, thank you for your work, for being here, and uh, for enlightening us tonight. And thank you all for thank staying. You. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Good job.